It feels so great to return to the Cosmere. It has been a while since I've read any Cosmere book, and I know I'm a little bit late reviewing this one, but better late than never. Welcome to Worth a Read, where I'll give you a spoiler-free description of a book, give you my opinions, and let you know if I think it's worth your time. Today, I'll be reviewing Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. No, this is the first of Sanderson's secret projects that are releasing all throughout the year, and Sanderson's Kickstarter campaign was the single biggest Kickstarter of all time. So obviously, there is a lot of people excited for these secret projects, myself included, and I plan on reviewing all of them on the channel. I'm currently finishing up the secret project number two, so I'll have a video up for that soon as well. Now, Tress was actually the first book I read this year, way back in January. I'm just now getting around to reviewing it. I don't know why, uh, but it was such a great way to start off the year with this fun and cozy, whimsical book. I'm hoping it kind of signals a positive trajectory of my reading this year, We'll see. Now, I purposefully went into this completely blind. I didn't read any of the preview chapters. I don't even really know anything about the other secret projects either, so this was a complete surprise for me. Really, it's unlike any other Cosmere book that I've read, and I've read all of them. This story is much more whimsical. It has sort of a fairy tale vibe to it. I would say it's perfect for young adult audiences. It definitely feels like it's more of a YA book, but a very well-crafted YA. And I'm not trying to say it is a a fairy tale, I feel like that would be giving Tress a disservice. This isn't some cookie cutter story intent on teaching a moral and nothing else. No, it has a lot of depth to it. It has, you know, well-rounded characters, some really great world building, uh, and it draws on a lot of other elements from other genres as well. By now, you've probably heard that one of Sanderson's inspirations for Tress of the Emerald Sea was The Princess Bride, and this is one of my favorite movies and one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, and Sanderson mentioned that he and his wife, they they love the movie, but his wife brought up how Buttercup, the princess, is just not really that proactive. And that's something I noticed as well, and this is Sanderson's answer to it, is Tress of the Emerald Sea. That was the main inspiration, and you definitely see that in the comedy and just the narration of Tress of the Emerald Sea. Also, the slight fairy tale vibes like I mentioned, I feel like it really starts off feeling like a fairy tale, and then that sort of slips away and it becomes more of a seafaring fantasy, but it has that wonderful voice of the narrator, which I'll get into a bit later. Now, for all those Cosmere fans out there, I was extremely surprised to find that a very familiar face in the Cosmere uh, is the one narrating this story. Again, I didn't know anything about these secret projects before going into this, so that was such a big surprise to me. But before I get into the story and tell you what this book is about, let me first answer the question, do you need to read other Cosmere books before reading this one? I would say no, you don't need to, and Tress is kind of weird because it references pretty much every Cosmere world work out there. I mean, it references Warbreaker, Mistborn, the Stormlight Archive, Elantris, pretty much everything, uh, even some things in the Cosmere that I think haven't even happened yet. There really is a lot of Cosmere Easter eggs. However, none of them are that vital. They're not things that you need to understand to enjoy uh, and to understand this story. Yes, you may find it more enjoyable if you've read other Cosmere books and you can pick up on all the references, but this book still does amazing on its own. And I would probably even say it's a good place to start in the Cosmere if you want a standalone book that's a bit more whimsical. However, it's not really a good representation of his other Cosmere stories, because again, this one is very different. In Tress of the Emerald Sea, we're told the story of Tress, a young woman who lives a simple life on her desolate island home known simply as The Rock. Located in an emerald green sea, nobody is allowed to leave the island besides the royal family and sailors. Here, Tress enjoys collecting cups brought in by sailors from faraway lands and listening to stories told by her friend Charlie, the Duke's son. Now, the Emerald Green Sea is not your typical sea. On this planet, there are 12 
12 moons that rain down 12 different types of spores onto the planet's surface. And the 12 colored seas are not made of water, they're made of these spores. Now when these spores interact with water, they have various nasty effects depending on which type of spore it is, making seafaring relatively dangerous depending on which sea you're traversing. However, when handled with care, these spores can also have a lot of practical uses. Now the story is Tress's journey as she leaves her island and travels the world of Lumar uh, in, in search of her beloved Charlie, who is kidnapped by the evil sorceress. A journey where she must travel to the Midnight Sea, the most dangerous ocean on Lumar. And let me just say, this book exceeded my expectations in every way. It's not long enough that it can become a slog. I mean, it reads really fast, the chapters are really quick, and the third act especially was very well done, uh, which if you've read any Sanderson, that's usually the case. It is amazing to see what Sanderson comes up with when he writes for just the sheer joy of it. And also, having a Princess Bride Cosmere book is simply lovely. I really enjoyed it, uh, and again, it is very, it's very quick to read. The chapters are very short. Uh, it makes it so that you can easily pick up and read a chapter here or there in your free time, uh, or you're probably just gonna end up binge reading it in a day or two. It's really a difficult book to stay away from, and the one thing that I think made it so great is the narration and the voice of the narrator. <laughs> story is narrated through Hoyd's perspective, and you get his customary, you know, cheeky tone, and Hoyd's witty humor is really what elevates this story. As a storyteller, he's often interrupting the story with his own personal commentary and remarks, often even breaking the fourth wall. Sanderson really manages to add so much to the story through Hoyd's narration, and again, that makes it such a unique Cosmere book. Worldbringers like myself spend decades combing through folk tales, legends, myths, histories, and drunken bar songs looking for the most unique stories. We hunt for bravery, cleverness, heroism, and we find no shortage of such virtues. Legends are silly with them, but the person who is willing to reconsider their assumptions, the hero who can sit down and reevaluate their life, well, now that is a gemstone that truly glitters, friend. The narrator keeps it really entertaining and engaging while also providing some really profound passages, and that's something that Sanderson does really, really well. I know a lot of people give him a hard time for his prose. You know, Sanderson's prose is not really flowery, it's pretty to the point, but he always has some really hard-hitting and thought-provoking passages. And this is a book that's pretty easy to speed through, but then you're going to think about it for a long time afterwards. Now, if you're a big Cosmere fan like myself, you are probably waiting for Hoyd's origin story. And Sanderson said that he wanted to practice writing in, uh, in Hoyd's style before he writes the origin story, and that's what this book is. This is that practice. Tress of the Emerald Sea. Uh, so now I am just, I am so excited to see what Sanderson does next with Hoyd. I really cannot wait to see Hoyd's origin. And I don't think the tone of Hoyd's origin is going to be as whimsical as this, uh, but this was just good practice to really nail that, that storyteller's voice. If you have read the Stormlight Archive and you enjoyed some of the, the stories in there, uh, like Wandersail or The Dog and the Dragon, then Tress of the Emerald Sea is sort of like a full-length novel version of that. Now, Sanderson's whimsy and his humor doesn't always land well for everyone, you know, everybody enjoys different types of comedy, uh, and sometimes that was the case for me as well. It took me a little while to get into this book, and at times the humor does come off maybe a little juvenile, uh, but I still think it's just a fun, light-hearted read that isn't meant to be taken super seriously. Occasionally, I think that the witty humor isn't quite as witty as Sanderson is maybe intending for it to be, uh, but I think overall, for the most part, the humor is pretty great, and also it's broken up by by these hard-hitting, thought-provoking parts, so it does have a pretty good balance. 
Okay, now we need to talk about the characters, and one trope that I really love is the found family trope, when a group of unrelated characters come together and, and form a bond and a relationship, uh, their own little family, through shared experiences. Sanderson has done this really well in the, you know, the original Mistborn trilogy and the Stormlight Archive with Bridge 4. That is something I love so much in those stories, and we see that again. We see another great found family in this book. Tress and Huck and the rest of the crew are constantly facing new dangers on their adventure, and their bonds are growing strong stronger and stronger. And Tress herself is a very likable protagonist. I feel like she's she's got a really good heart uh, and I enjoyed reading from her perspective. I also really loved the banter between her and Huck. And that leads me to another trope that I love and that is animal companions. I love a good animal companion. I still feel like my probably my favorite animal companion is in Sabriel and you know that whole series by Garth Nix. And while Huck isn't my favorite animal companion, I still still really love him. Uh, he he reminds me a lot of Reepicheep from the Chronicles of Narnia. Also, I just want to say that I love how Tress collects mugs. Uh, I love having, you know, a small collection of just fun mugs. That's something that uh, me and my family have always given as gifts, you know, during different holidays. We'll always get each other just, you know, a fun, unique mug. And so I guess I could kind of relate a little bit. And as for some of the other crew members like Fort and Soleil, uh, I thought they were all written pretty well. And I really hope that we're going to see more of these characters, you know, in references in future Cosmere books. It's also worth noting that the deaf character that Sanderson wrote was written with the help of special sensitivity writers in order to do that character justice. I also really loved how Hoyd, you know, if there's like a background crew member, if there's any background characters that just aren't really that important to the story, Hoyd would just call them Doug. So there's a lot of Dougs, and I love that. Now, I kind of already did talk about the world building at the beginning, so I don't want to spoil much more, but I do want to use this section to talk about fluidization. In this world, people sail on seas of spores. Uh, I didn't want it to be water. I wanted it to be something different. Fortunately, when I was young, I was taught about something called fluidization. Fluidization is a process that involves transforming a solid material into a fluid-like state by introducing a gas or liquid into the material. It's commonly used in industrial processes such as chemical reactions, material handling, and particle separation. But it really feels like you're just in a liquid. In a liquid. And, and yet you raise your hand yeah. and it's completely dry. Well, and then if you turn it off while your hands are in there, you did this earlier, you feel suddenly uh, trapped, yeah. which is just so perfect because that's how I imagined it uh, when I was describing the ships just like lurching and stopping in place. And this was basically Sanderson's inspiration for how the seas on Lumar work and how, you know, how the spores and everything move like liquid. Now, I also just really love how unique every Cosmere world is from the next one. I was not expecting to open this book and discover a world where the different oceans are made up of spores. I love that so much. This book is in, is very unique, and that's one reason why I love the Cosmere in general. Sanderson has an incredible imagination. Now, no book is perfect, and so I want to get into some of the things that weren't exactly perfect. If you do not like seafaring nautical adventures, then you are going to find especially the middle section of this book to be a little bit of a drag. I still found the pacing to be great, but I do see why some people might find that section of the book to be a little bit slower because it's all about building uh, the crewmates relationships. Uh, and if you don't like the characters, then yeah, you, you will find this to be a bit of a drag as well. I already mentioned how the humor is just not going to land for everyone, but my biggest gripe that I kept thinking about is where is the water coming from? Tress mentions they have wells, but that doesn't make a lot of sense because well water comes from the surface, and if there's no rain, then... It, I, I don't understand. And also, what would what would separate the well water from not seeping into the ocean? I wonder if there's like large underground lakes and, and oceans that existed before the spores, and these would have to be close by to like silver deposits or something. Or maybe there's some sort of bacteria that can create water from oxygen and hydrogen that's in minerals. I don't know, because like there's no water shortage on this planet. They have barrels and barrels full of water. I don't know, maybe I'm thinking about it too much, but it bothered me the whole time I was reading the book. And yes, I know this is meant to just be a lighthearted, fun book. It probably doesn't even matter. 
Overall, I do think I could see this becoming sort of a comfort read, something that I'll come back and read again if I'm looking for a very light and cozy book uh, to break up the monotony of reading some big epic fantasy series. Don't get me wrong, I love big epic fantasy series, but sometimes you just need something a little bit more light. And Tress of the Emerald Sea is such a fresh and original book, really there's a lack of good standalone fantasy books. And yes, this is a standalone, even if there is a ton of Cosmere Easter eggs, I think this book works great as a standalone. Good old Brando Sando had a lot of fun writing this book, and you can tell. It, it seeps from the pages. It's very whimsical, and that's a really great switch from reading some, you know, dark fantasy series. It's a refreshing addition to the Cosmere, and it's sort of a Cosmere version of an adult fairy tale. Now, with the success of The Secret Projects, a lot of readers might think that Sanderson favors quantity over quality recently, uh, and I would say that I feel like his books have a pretty consistent strong quality to them, and this book doesn't drop any of that. It's a lot of fun, so yes, I do think this book is worth a read. Let me know if you're interested in reading it, or if you've read Tress of the Emerald Sea, let me know your thoughts. Anyways, I want to say a huge thank you to all of my patrons and my channel members.